All right. So we can have a lot of different kinds of servers. All right. Our most important one that we're talking about now is a web server. But there's also database servers. And there can be file servers and FTP servers and email servers and, and all sorts of different kinds of servers. Regardless of the kind of server, though, in general, servers take requests and respond to requests. All right. So what does a web server do? Web server takes requests for web pages, pardon me, and responds to those requests by sending out the web page. So we have our clients. And when we say a client, I mean the clients do sort of the opposite of a server. The client is the, the, the system that's making the request. And the server is the one that fulfills the request. All right. So the, server, the client is typically connected to the internet. Which is drawn like a cloud. Because what happens in there is magic. All right. Really what happens in there we don't care about in this class. It somehow makes it from the client to the server. There's some squirrels in there doing something, right. All right. So that's represented as a cloud. And the client makes a request for a web page. How does a client make a request for a web page? What action would the client do to make a request for a web page? Type in the URL into their web browser. So you open up Chrome and type in www.google.com. That's one way to make a request. What's another way to make a request? Click on the Google icon. Click on a link. All right. For that, click on a bookmark or whatever. So all those are ways that the client makes a request. Now, there's all kinds of things that happen in the meantime, uh, you know, between here and here. You know, the URL you know, is translated to an IP address and blah, 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 and it gets routed through a bunch of machines and the squirrels take it and so on and so forth. The bottom line is somehow that request that the client makes makes it to the appropriate web server. All right? That's the part we're not interested in. It just happens. It happens by magic. All right? What's the server's job? The server's job is to respond to that request. And what does that mean in the context of a web server? It means it sends back through the internet to the client the files necessary to view the web page that was requested. So the client will get back a package that will consist of HTML, CSS, and the images that are on the page, and other files. Maybe even some JavaScript. For convenience, when I talk about this from now on, I'll probably just say they get back some HTML. But when I say that, know that I realize they get HTML plus some other stuff. All right, they get the web page. So, the server's life for static pages is easy. All right? What does the server do? The server finds the file that, that was asked for, file or files that were asked for, and returns them to the client. It would be like uh, going into McDonald's and ordering a sandwich, right? What does the server do in McDonald's when you order a sandwich? You order a Big Mac. The server turns, finds in the bin somewhere the Big Mac, pulls it out, and gives it to you. The server has a very easy role in that context. It finds what you asked for, wherever it is on the disk, and sends it back, delivers it to the client. All right? 
And so that's how it is with static pages. Static pages, all the server's doing is finding the pages and sending them to them. It's just grabbing them and sending them to them. Doesn't do any really other processing. All right? The problem with static pages, though, is that while in one respect they're cool, I mean, it's great to be able to go to a, a restaurant and find out what the menu is and, and to see what hours they're open and to get their phone number and all that. But really, it's sort of like just electronic brochures, right? Nothing really, nothing about it that's like an application, right? Nothing about it that allows us to do any like real sort of processing, all right? What sort of processing am I talking about? Well, placing an order for something. All right. Um, finding out what the weather is in a particular city. All right. Now, could you imagine, you know, how would it be that if weather.com was accomplished via static web pages? All right. You'd have to have someone editing every day the web page for every city on earth. <laughs> All right, and that really doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I mean, so what do you suppose happens instead? What happens instead with server-side scripting is you don't have a completed web page. You have the instructions to create a web page. And those instructions take ingredients from a couple different places and puts together and assembles a web page based on the request. All right. If we're going to continue the fast food analogy, that would be like Subway. All right. You go to a Subway restaurant. All right. Are they like McDonald's in that do they have bins of all their sandwiches that you could possibly order just waiting for you and you come in and say, you know, I want a tuna salad with, um, you know, tomatoes and onions, and they go to the bin and pull that one out. No. That would be ridiculous to do that, right? All right, because there's just too many possibilities that you could order. All right? Just like it would be ridiculous to have an HTML page for each city from weather.com. All right? Instead, what do they have? They have some ingredients. They have the different breads and they have the different items that they put on the sandwich. And they have a server that can do some processing. That server takes the recipe that's in their head for how you make a tuna salad sandwich. It takes the ingredients, that is the bread, the lettuce, the tomatoes, and so on. And it takes input from the users about what they want and it puts that all together and it makes a sandwich on the fly. All right? Does it pull a pre-made sandwich out from a bin somewhere? A sandwich is made on the fly based on the instructions that the server has, based on the ingredients, based on the user input. All right? And that's what we have with server-side scripting. Uh, of course, you don't get sandwiches when you uh, uh, access a web page. Yeah, unfortunately. Let's make that clear. All right. Now, here's a key thing to remember. All right. When the day is done, when the processing is done, when the request is satisfied, in both cases, what gets delivered to the client? The same thing. Right? You go to McDonald's, you go to the subway. You come out with a sandwich, all right? The sandwich made in a different manner. In one case, the sandwich was pre-made, and the server simply retrieved it and handed it to you. In, other, in the other case, it was made just for you right at the moment that you asked for it. But in both cases, you end up with a sandwich. Just like in both cases, regardless of how server-side scripting process, you end up with a package that includes HTML, CSS, and all the files necessary for that. 
That's an important thing to remember, all right, about that. In other words, even though you go to Subway, they don't hand you a recipe when they're done. You can't eat a recipe, all right? A browser doesn't understand a server-side script. A browser understands a web page, an HTML page, all right? So let's look at this model and see how it's different with server-side scripting, all right? With dynamic web pages, all right? In simple static pages, the client request consists only of the URL. So if, if I was going to my restaurants page, I would type in www.myrestaurant.com slash menu.html. That's the URL I want. All right. With dynamic pages, though, we can give some more information. All right. We can give, for example, that we want to visit, we want to do a Google search, and oh yes, the thing that we're searching for is ASP.NET. Or we are logging on to this site, and oh yes, my username is mzellers, my password is password, all right, or whatever. So we can we give first right off the bat. Typically, with server-side scripting, the request is more involved because it not only includes the URL that's being requested, it involves some user input, all right, being, being, uh, being sent uh, with the request. The server has a more involved job with dynamic web pages because the server doesn't have a completed web page out there. Right? Weather.com doesn't have a web page out there for every city in the world. Google does not have a search results page for every possible thing that you could search about. Amazon does not have a separate page for every single item in their inventory, which has to be in the millions. Right? Just to think about that is, is absurd eBay doesn't have a page for every item, all right? In other words, when you go place a bid on something, there's not a HTML code or saying, ooh, someone bid on that fishing pole. Let me go and change the highest <laughs> price. So, you know, those things are absurd, right? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. So clearly something else is going on. And what's going on is the server doesn't have completed web pages. The server, in essence, sort of has a shell of a web page. All right, and it has instructions on how to sort of fill out that shell. All right, so if we were to look at Google search results, no matter what we search for, all the Google search results kind of look the same, right? If we went to look at eBay, different items on eBay, the details of it are going to be different, but all those pages are sort of going to look the same. There's a basic shell that gets filled in with some details. Likewise with Amazon. All right. So what happens in this case? When the user makes a request, those scripts will often take the input that the user typed in, access a database, and maybe bring in some other stuff into the equation, like Maybe weather.com, instead of having their own database, talks to the National Weather Service's 
computer system to find out what the what the weather is in Elyria, Ohio today. All right. And the server processes all that and goes through manipulations to process and takes all that together and creates on the fly an HTML page made just for that particular request. Now, let's go and let's play around a little bit with Google to kind of, of, um, kind of cement some of these, these concepts about a dynamic web page. And let's look at some of these uh, things in action. So if I go in, here I am at Google. Yeah. First thing you'll notice is I have an input box, right? I'm going to be supplying parameters to Google's server-side script, namely what it is I want to search for. So if I want to search for ASP.NET, there we go. If I want to, and again, if we look, we see some ads on the top and on the side and then we see our search results. If I do a search for PHP, same sort of thing. Interestingly enough, no ads for that, though. But these links are the same, if I remember right. Yeah, those links stay consistent. So we have a shell of a page. In other words, this part of the page stays the same, regardless of what we're searching for. And this section of it and this section of it is a little bit different, just depending on um, the particular term. It gets even deeper than that, because let's say I search for Italian restaurant. Don't ask me why I always pick food examples. Um, maybe because it's like right before lunch or, or something. All right. Do we notice anything interesting about this? They're all local, right? Now, does that make you proud to think that all the best Italian restaurants in the world are located <laughs> right here in Lorain County? No. All right? That's not the case. What is happening here? Well, this is something, this is a page that's made for me on the fly. All right? Now, in this case, not only did it take the input from the search from, from the form, where I typed in that I wanted Italian restaurants, it actually looked at other aspects of the request, namely my IP address. From my IP address, it figured out where I was, and it used that as an ingredient in the searching. All right? Google is very sophisticated. I mean, that's where Google, you know, that's Google's claim to fame, and that's why they're in the position that they are, is giving the most relevant search results. And there's any number of different factors that they consider, including other things that you've searched for before. All right, a lot of things go into there. Um, so if I search for Italian restaurants and my brother searches for Italian restaurants living in New York, he's going to get a different answer than I am. And that really is where the web can start getting interesting because we're not simply having electronic brochures and, 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 and instead of having a paper copy of a menu, we display it on a web page. All right. Instead, we have really an application, an application that has behavior, and it can do stuff, and it can send stuff uh, to the user custom for their request. So really, there's some other stuff that can go into play even on this. All right. Other things that can come into play are who the person is. 
So, for example, both of us go to the same URL for angel, right? Both of us then type in our credentials, user ID and password, and submit it. We go to the same URL, yet your screen is going to look different than mine. Why? Well, because you're you and I'm me. I'm signed up for a certain number of courses. You're signed up for a certain number of courses. All right? Even if we go into this course, both of us, both me and you, it's going to look different. Why? Because I'm in the role of the instructor. You're in the role of student. All right? So we can make the page customized for that particular person. And that's where, again, you really get the power. So Amazon is really an order entry application, but it's built through a web interface. So you can go and place an order with Amazon. It updates their databases and, and starts a process for you getting uh, the goods delivered. The difference is, though, is that unlike old time order entry systems that were done on a mainframe computer, this is done via a web interface, so anyone can place an order uh, via it. Questions about this? Okay, so let's get more specific about this class because this class focuses on server-side scripting. By the way, there is client-side scripting as well. And client-side scripting is normally going to be JavaScript. And the rationale from JavaScript, for JavaScript rather, is that the client is also a computer. So the client can do some neat stuff too, if we just let it. However, we don't want the client to do anything too important, or anything too secure, or anything too resource intensive. Why? Well, because we don't know who that client is. Right? And we don't know what software they have installed and their security restrictions via a browser and so on and so forth. So we let the browser through uh, client-side JavaScript just do some fairly small sort of things, like tweak the appearance of a page that's already, already there, like with mouse over menus or something like that. How about MP3 or SWF? Would that be thrown onto the client or would that be? It would have to be. Well, yeah, the, the server would deliver the file, and the client would have software to run it, would have like a plug-in to run it. All right. So this class, this class is focused on the server side. We'll touch on some client-side stuff, like when we talk about form validation. But for the most part, the focus is on uh, server-side stuff. We're going to be using ASP.NET in this class. Um, ASP.NET is not really a language. It's more of a platform. Um, it is a, um, uh, probably the best way to put it is a framework. All right. What do you think of when you hear the word framework? What does, what does that imply to you? An outline? Okay. Structure. A structure? Pardon me? Something that will hold something. All these are, are excellent thoughts and excellent expressions of what a framework is. Framework is something you can build on top of. All right? Um, what ASP.NET provides is it provides a set of components that are very common in the world of web development. Things that probably every single website needs to be able to do. All right? It provides components for them. Your job then, becomes as a developer, it becomes a little bit easier. Because you don't have to write everything from scratch. You just have to mix and match and configure different components that you build on the screen. Now, I don't mean to... Um, Minimize that process, because that's still fairly challenging. But you're not going to be writing everything from scratch. You're going to be using components that have been pre-written pre for that. 
you know, it's like in the old, you know, in the old, old days, you know, the whole notion of manufacturing with interchangeable parts, right? You don't need a craftsman to craft every product individually. You have a, a, an assembly line process where you have a set of parts and you assemble something from that starting point. That makes you a lot more productive than if you were crafting every item individually. All right. And it's sort of the same idea here. Every website has validation on it, right? Every, any website you think of has some form of validation on it. So therefore, why should a developer have to worry about writing the code to do the validation of something? All right? At least certain kinds of validation. All right? Many websites are going to pull data from a database and display the results in a table, you know? Um, just about any web or many many websites will, will need that sort of functionality and therefore there's components to facilitate that in the ASP.NET framework. Now within the ASP.NET framework you can through your code manipulate those components and that's where the fun really starts. Okay? Is that you can write code to manipulate those components Therefore, associated with ASP.NET is, first of all, the set of components in the framework, and secondly, some programming languages that we can use to manipulate those components. Now, in this class, the programming language we're going to use is C-sharp. Right. The other one that is sometimes used, probably more so in the past than now, is Visual Basic. Both these languages do the same sort of thing. They manipulate the components on the page. All right. And we'll see examples of that. C Sharp is becoming very widespread, uh, being used in a very widespread way. C Sharp is also good because C Sharp syntactically resembles many other programming languages. It resembles Java very closely, it resembles JavaScript, it resembles PHP, and so on. Students in the past would sometimes, if they were taking a JavaScript class and taking a VB class at the same time, would get confused looking at an if statement because JavaScript if statements look one way, um, VB if statements looked another way. Well, C Sharp and JavaScript if statements look real similar. So there, there's that sort of advantage uh, to that as well. Now, those of you that have me for the HTML class, and maybe even some of you that have me for the Java class, I don't know if there's anyone in here who did, know that as far as IDEs go, I'm kind of old school, right? I don't like to use IDEs, all right? Uh, in the HTML class and in the scripting class, the, the CISS232 class, typically I just say open up a text editor. What's Dreamweaver? What is that? <laughs> what do you need that for? You write the code. Don't write the code for it. Eclipse? Nah. Don't write your Java code in Eclipse. Write that. Here's my thought process. My thought process in those classes is that really what we don't want to do is we don't want you learning the IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. It's a tool that you use to create programs. I think it's important to understand the code on a real nuts and bolts level and therefore that's why I, I typically just use text editors. If I could get away with using punch cards I'd use those. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, they got rid of all the card readers here, so that's not possible. I do make an exception for this in the world of ASP.NET, because although theoretically you could create ASP.NET code in a text editor, the framework is so involved and is so rich that you'd, you'd have a real hard time doing it, and it would be counterproductive. Now, that doesn't mean 
that I want us to be at the mercy of these IDEs. And what's the IDE for ASP.NET? It's Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is a tool that we can use to create ASP.NET applications and uh, create and use the components 